hello everyone and welcome back to another video my name is Helen and today I have a recommendation video for you um this is one that actually this is you probably see by the title this is historical romances um <clears throat> but these are what I like to what I consider more or less more um more or less more I'm sorry um <laughs> more modern historical romances which means they were written in the more modern times so the last you know 20 years um so i think all of these were pretty much written within the um 21st century most of them um i'm not gonna bother Ooh putting what my ratings are or saying what my ratings are for these necessarily because all of these are books I like. I, I'm not going to recommend a book I don't myself like. Um, now, I kind of teethed, I guess you could say, um, my first foray into truly reading when I was younger. When I first learned to read, I was um, 10 years old. I was in the fifth grade. Um, I'm dyslexic and reading did not come easy to me like it did most people. It took me several years to get there and um, all of a sudden one day it just kind of clicked for me and I could read. I still have, I, I still struggle to read, um, especially if it's like verbally. I, I, I have a hard time with that. Um, I have a hard time processing what I read sometimes, which... Um, but the more I, I read, the easier it is. If I go long stretches of time without reading, it will take me longer and I'll struggle more than I would otherwise. Which is why I try not to let myself fall into reading slumps of any kind. Because as long as I keep reading, I don't struggle. But if I ever stop, I know from experience, getting back into reading is always... like It's like doing mental gymnastics when you haven't been to the gym and then you just decided to, you know, go straight into a workout without stretching. And I have no desire to do that. Um, but when I first started reading, then I read a lot of historical romances from like, so like Bodice Ripper era ones from like 70s, 80s, 90s. My great grandma um, would get books from like the Salvation Army and um, yard sales and things like that. You know, most of those were historical romances and so I read a ton of them um a ton of them growing up but I don't feel today those are worth recommending you know they're very problematic um probably why I have the love for dark romance that I do I do not have but it's very easy for me to separate fiction from reality like of course I don't want a relationship like some people have in a book and of course I don't want my life to end up how some people do in a book. Reading is escapism. It's fantasy, you know. Um, there's a difference between reading for knowledge and reading for pleasure. And I like to think I do both, but I'm not a nonfiction reader. I don't hardly read nonfiction books at all anymore. Because I I can't... I, I, I Learning and reading are two different things for me. And I am an auditory learner um so if I'm going if I want to learn about a subject I'm going to look for an audiobook uh, at the very very least but most of the time I'm going to try and find a YouTube video of someone else explaining it to me um but anyway all of that to say I love historical romances and I did not read hardly any if any at all in 2022 I kind of um I already <laughs> stepping into reading more historical um right now I'm I'm in there it's the by uh the the series by Gillian Bonder Bondershock 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 the first one is the shield and the thistle and the second is the oath I'm in the middle of the oath right now now these are historical romances with a fantasy flair to them the first deals with time travel and then the second one the oath um the main heroine is a druid 
um, or a witch. She's a, uh, you know, a nature witch, whatever. There are many different forms of that, but that's basically it, you know. And I'm not going to be recommending any books that have fantastical elements. All of these are the historical romances that could be real um, to some extent. Probably aren't. Again, you know, it, it's a fan, you know, it's a fictional novel. But, um, you know, that there isn't anything weird, truly magical going on, I should say. Um, and again, I, I tried to do like a wide array of what I felt were like eras. And so there are a few of these that aren't quite truly historical. They're more like um, modern historical. So like 20th century uh, historical. And I'm going to start with one of those and I'll put pictures up over here and I will do my best to list all of the books I talk about in the description box. I might miss one. If I do, I'm very sorry. But again, I will put the picture of the book up on the screen. So if it's not down below, just pause the video so you can get the name. But the first one is Love and War by Shira Lynn. Um, and this is, this book has caused quite a stir and I don't know really, um, what side to be on. I read this book really without having any knowledge of what it was. Like as soon as it came out, it was kind of like the release of it was kind of hyped up by some people I followed here on booktube. And, um, I had, like, I used to be kind of weirdly obsessed with, World War Two era history, not even necessarily the war, but like the times, I guess, like, I really like fashion and makeup and 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s fashion and makeup always like grossly fascinated me. Um, I read a couple other books. What are you doing, Kelvin? Can you come up here? Can you come up here? You say hello. You say hello. You say hello. Oh, good baby. Good baby. I know I'm in your chair, huh? But, you know, anyway, and I never quite understood that fascination. I read a lot, like, again, when I learned to read, I either had the books my, my great-grandma had or I had the library at school. And they had a lot of the real history, like s true stories or like fictional stories of true events. Um, that was like really big, especially my fifth grade and sixth grade teachers, little classroom libraries. Um, sorry, I have cat hair stuck in my lip gloss. Had a lot of the, I can't remember, something Zimmerman. I'll put a couple pictures up just for some reference. And a lot of my early learning was through the eyes of other people. And so this book is about Nazis. Like the main guy in this is literally a Nazi doctor. Like he is German raised, German bred. And yes, he falls in love with a black woman, um, Victoire, who is a black singer. She lives in France. There is a side story with his best friend, who um, is also in, in love with a black woman um, and has a child with her. But I know it doesn't sit right with a lot of people. And honestly, it doesn't sit right with me. I didn't realize that's what this book was. And it it's interesting to like see him humanized and that yes, he's only with the Nazis because he has to be. But at the same time, how many other Nazis <laughs> were given that excuse and they tried to humanize them when they still allowed the absolute horror of things happen to all of those in the internment camps. Um, so I don't know how I feel about this book. I do want to tentatively recommend it because I think as far as his historical anything goes, it's a great historical read. If you can manage to separate and that's hard I don't know um 
but I do I do still think this book is worth reading if anything to open up these kinds of conversations and just because a book is problematic doesn't mean it's not worth reading so that these kind of conversations can exist because I do think it is helpful and it has been helpful for the book community to acknowledge that sometimes the things we read and we hype up are problematic but maybe instead of hyping the book up and then just like cold turkey radio silence when there's some pushback Kelvin no yelling uh-uh 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 sorry um and instead of just radio silence then on a novel or a book why don't we open up those conversations with others educate ourselves a little bit on why it's problematic and focus our discussion around a book there because we can still feel inspired by literature and still acknowledge that yeah it's problematic I like books a lot of books that could be seen as problematic and for some people that they they are it's triggering to read so go into it with you know make sure you look at trigger warnings I think it's becoming very common in our this day and age for trigger warnings to exist because they're necessary we never know what someone's going to be triggered by um and it could be mundane or it could be something more than that um the next book i want to recommend is the beast of beswick by amelie howard and this is a beauty and the beast retail retelling thane is i think he's a duke um who he's kind of scarred and he's surly and this woman what is her name astrid astrid um she needs her and her sister they're in a bad situation and she's trying to get them out quick and so she offers to marry thane and he's absolutely dumbfounded she's like you need a wife you'll need an heir and i will be willing to provide all of this for you um, if you let me and my sister come live with you and stay with you and he, you know, tries to call her bluff and it kind of goes from there. I loved this book. This was one of my favorite reads the year it came out. I read it that January. I reread it two other times. I think that was in 2021 actually. And I haven't reread it in the last year, but I intend to reread it again this year. And this book is one it has definitely stuck with me. I did not like the follow-up novel at all. Um, I was very uh, disappointed by it, I guess. <laughs> um, but it, I think as far as historical romances go, this was a good one. Um, now, the next one is actually an author, and she has two different series I want to recommend. Um, now, I have a couple key books from each series but I do recommend you read these in order because the threads for the next books are planted in the previous and these are all really super quick and that's Kerrigan Byrne and the first is the Victorian Rebel series and these were kind of toted as a dark take on a historical romance novel and honestly these are like bodice rippers just tidied up for modern day um because they're not even really that dark <laughs> um I mean, now they're more erotic than your typical historical romance, which I enjoyed, but they're not, um, they're not very long books. I think most of these are between two and 300 pages. I don't think any of them exceed that. Um, and they begin with The Highwaymen, which is about Pharaoh Lee Mackenzie, who is, um, supposedly a widow, and in a way she is, I guess, um, of a man who died in prison and one of his prison friends gets out and comes to find her for reasons um and yeah the series is kind of like kick-started by the events that happen in this book um now i really think the first four books in this series are really like i don't know they're okay they're they're good they're not the greatest but they're good 
Um, I think I actually might have rated all of them like four or five stars, but they're not horrible. Um, my favorite was definitely the third, the Highlander, um, which is about Colonel Liam McKenzie, um, who is a Laird of the McKenzie clan, and Mrs. Philomena, who is a spinster, um... I, I, it would be spoilers to tell you exactly what the situation was, but, like, basically she's put into a mental asylum, and she's rescued by some of the ladies in the previous books. Um, yeah, and that's that on that about that. Um, and she goes to Scotland to Liam's place to be a governess for his children he has two older children who are both hellcats that need taming and uh Philomena kind of does help with the taming of the children um and then the one in the series I liked the best was um A Dark and Stormy Night which is also the first book in the Good Girls series that I also recommend. Um, again, these are very like edible series as you can binge them. They're very short, very light fare. They're hot and steamy. Um, there are some other things. Again, these, again, these were toted as like dark romances, but they're not. They're, they're not. They're dark for historical romances, but that just, you know, i.e. reads between the line that, that means they're erotic or more erotic. I wouldn't even say they're that erotic, but, um, A Dark and Stormy Night or, oh, what is its other name? What is its other name? It has another name. I'll try and put both covers because it has two different names and, um, Oh, it's also called Seducing a Stranger. Okay. Um, sorry, but this is about Prudence Good, who, um, is a younger-ish. She's the oldest unmarried daughter, but she's a younger daughter of an earl or a baron. I can't remember for sure what he, her father is. Um, and she kind of accidentally, in a way, she's fixing to get married, and she solicits this man who turns out to be an undercover um, detective police type guy who is in the rest of the series. It's Sir Carlton Morley. And we love a man in a mask. And he, uh, she, uh, she solicits him. She's getting married to this man. She doesn't really want to get married to and she kind of wants to experience life. And, uh, she kind of winds up pregnant and then Sir Carlton Morley's called to her, uh, wedding because her bridegroom is dead at her feet. And yet she didn't kill him. But it doesn't look good for Prudence, dearest. And I really loved this book. I was super impressed with it. Um, I do think it's the best edition to the Good Girl series. I like the second book in this series, which is about her sister, Honoria. Um, I wasn't really, I've read the other two books about her two other sisters that are known about. Um, and then I think there's two more books in the series, but I haven't read those. But I do recommend them. Again, as far as historical romances go, they're very erotic. <laughs> And I really loved that. And then the next one is also kind of a series, but kind of not. And um, this is One Good Earl Deserves a Lover by Sarah McLean. Um, and this is the second book in the Rules of Scoundrels series. And this is about four um, characters, people who own a, like, 
gambling hell um uh that also kind of i think has like some erotic overtures to it and yeah so this book is about philippa who really 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 wants to know how um how babies are made and what sex is kind of all about um she's trying to you know sleuth her way into figuring that out and th th she kind of gets one of these guys to help her with it so yeah she she's doing scientific work for the lord <laughs> but i really liked this book i liked the first two books in the series okay the third book was not great and the fourth book was the biggest disappointment of a book I've ever read like the build up the lead up was all there for it to literally just be dashed within the first chapter which was irritating as fuck um but I do recommend this book in particular I don't recommend the series if you want to read it read it but I would probably just go ahead and read spoilers for the fourth book because it's this big huge secret that's built up literally for all three of the first books for it to not be that great at all and I was so sorely disappointed and I, it has prevented me from going back and reading Sarah McLean books um even though I hear a lot of great things about her and the next recommendation um is Lisa Claypus and she has several series the Wallflowers the Hathaways and the Ravenels and I think some other miscellaneous books that are all historical flavored but I really recommend the Hathaways. Um, the Ravenels are more like they're newer but I don't like those books as a whole. Um, and the Hathaways to me is everything the Ravenels can't even hope to be. Um, because the Hathaways they're just they're so good and especially the first book um, I think it's Again the Magic with um Amelia and Cam this is the sweetest most loving love story um I mean I really feel like Lisa Claypus made magic when she wrote this particular series um and it's the sweet spot it's all the historical flavor that you get um because the wallflower series is good but it's your typical historical romance you know each hero is a titled gentleman each woman is you know some sort of sultry wallflower um and you know there's scandal amok but the hathaways all of these books are very homey um we really start to see the departure from all the titled gentlemen like cam has money but he's he's romani um i think in fact the only titled anyone in this series might be Leo who is the brother of all of this gaggle of sisters and even he, I mean he's not your typical titled lord you know um they were raised as gentry and they kind of got the title by accident um I, I believe was how that happened so you know Leo was never even raised to be a titled gentleman and in fact Amelia does most of the uh legwork of that stuff for the majority of this series because some horrible things happen that kind of set the the Hathaways on the path they end up on um in the first book and this whole series is beautiful even up to the last one with Beatrix um it th this series I really feel was like high point of Lisa Claypus historical romance novels and the Ravenel those books are trash I wouldn't bother reading those in all honesty the first three or four books are okay and they just kind of like start deteriorating I I personally feel like a ghost writer who's writing Lisa Claypus's books now I don't they don't have the magic that older Lisa Claypus books have um and then the next one is Courtney Milan and I just feel like there is one thing Courtney Milan does well, and that is well-rounded characters with unique storylines. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted to recommend a couple books I haven't uh, recommended of hers before, um, simply because 
Courtney Milan is probably one of my very favorite authors ever. Like I have read every single book she has ever written besides her, she has a contemporary series and I don't think I'll ever read that. I'm not a contemporary girl. Um, but I wanted to recommend, point out a couple of her um, books I have not talked about yet. So let me, yep, here we are. Um, and the first one is The Countess Conspiracy, and this is the third book in the Brother Sinister series. And now this book, you need to read the uh, Eris effect that comes right before it because those two books happen at the same time. And there are things that you need that like, I feel like it'll be more impactful when you get to The Countess Conspiracy if you've already gone, if you've already read The Eris effect. And if you ever plan to read The Eris effect, you need to read The, the Countess Conspiracy or you need to read it before you read The Countess Conspiracy because again, they happen in um, a dual timelines. So a lot of, there, there's a lot of spoilers in The Countess Conspiracy and um, there's a lot of like foreshadowing of what's going to happen in The Heiress Effect. Um, but this is about Sebastian and Violet and Sebastian is kind of very popular for, um, and these are an alternative history type situation. Courtney Milan rewrites history a lot for her books and I actually kind of dig it. Um, because she does it so intelligently. Um, but Sebastian is a famed scientist for his time. And Violet is his widowed countess best friend. And as it turns out, there's quite a conspiracy. Because the mastermind behind um, Sebastian's scientific findings may or may not be entirely all of his own. Um, and Violet, you know, they're, they've been best friends their whole lives. Um, and Sebastian's always kind of loved Violet. I think Violet was a little older than him. They lived very close together. When she got married, um, her husband lived very close to Sebastian's family. And so they would still, they were still together all the time. You know, and he watched, she had miscarriage after miscarriage and she almost died until her husband he actually, he, he died, he passed away, and she was free of him. And now she didn't hate her husband. She actually really liked him. And she felt that she failed him a lot for not being able to provide him with an heir. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's, you know, so, so, bad, so Violet doesn't want children and she never has children. In fact, this is something I loved about this book. They go so far as Sebastian introduces her to, like, what was, uh, they're called a French letter, I believe, which was, like, the first kind of a condom used. And because he's like, no, if you don't want children, I'm not going to force that on you. So he either it's, pulls out so he doesn't ejaculate in her or they use these French letters, you know, um, or they do other kind of sexual acts because he's very respectful of the fact of he, he doesn't want to put Violet through that. You know, he watched her have miscarriage after miscarriage after miscarriage until she literally almost died. Um, and a doctor even told her, you know, don't have any more kids. Don't, don't try to do this. Don't try to have a baby. And I just loved that, that, you know, Violet was given a choice and it wasn't forced on her. There was no magical, all of a sudden she can have a baby because she's with this new man and it's fine. Like, no. Her and Sebastian do not have children. And I loved that. And the fact that she's a scientist, it, it just, this book was so lovely. I 100% recommend it. It is not your normal historical romance fair and you won't be disappointed. And then the second one, or the next one, is in the Turner series. And now there are three books in a novella in this series. Um, and I've talked about the novella extensively. I believe, what is it called? Oh, why can I never remember things? Um, it's called, uh, oh, I'll, never mind. It's not in this series. But there are three books in a novella. And now um, I have talked about, I think, the third book in this series, Unraveled. That's one of my very favorite books of all time. But this first book 
is actually a retelling kind of of Arthur and I believe in Courtney Mawan's author's notes she says that it's kind of like an allegory for Arthur and the Lady of the Lake and uh it, it's not how you think it is. I definitely recommend if you read this book to look up Courtney Mawan's like after notes to like kind of get the full effect of that after you read the book. Um, I actually got a special edition of it on my um, on my Nook that has all of that where she she talks about all of that um, and like all of the different things in this book uh, because the second book is also an allegory I think of Galahad but I could be ooh, I could be wrong it's about something like that um but this first book again it's like Arthur and the Lady of the Lake and this is about Anna Margaret whose mother has died and her father is dying and she's playing the nursemaid and um this man named Ash Turner who has kind of won the title of her father's title um in some way like their her home all of this stuff and he sets about trying to convince Anna Margaret to marry him <laughs> and yeah it goes from there um Ash's brother one of his brothers Smite was um at one point friends and now is a uh, frenemy or enemies ish um, with one of Anna Margaret's brothers. Her other brother is a deadbeat bully. And um, Ash's youngest brother, Mark, is a virgin um, newly appointed knight. Which is, you know, kind of a cool thing. I, I do... I recommend the series as a whole, but especially this first book because it is, it is so empowering for like women um because in so many historical books women aren't given a choice and in this book not only does Anna Margaret have a choice she has all of the choices um because you know she's Arthur she is Arthur and Ash is the lady of the lake offering her the sword that will make her king um that you know gives her her destiny Excalibur um, you know, that's the sword that came from the Lady of the Lake. It is the sword that made King Arthur as great, you know. The sword and the stone, yes, that, that made him king. But getting the blessing of the Lady in the Lake and getting Excalibur, that solidified him as, you know, one of the greatest mythological, mythological like, heroes and kings. And, um, that, you know, we, everyone knows about. Everyone knows who King Arthur is. Um, and the fact that Anna Margaret is Arthur in this book, uh, it just, it's so magical and it was so impactful and I, I 100% recommend it. Um, and I have several more. Let's see if I can get, let's see if, how fast I can get through them. So the next book I have is Kate of the Lost Colony and this is about one of Queen Elizabeth's favorite court maidens. Um, who ends up in a romance with Sir Walter Raleigh, which Queen Elizabeth does not like and has her sent on a ship um, to what becomes the colony of Roanoke Island um, that, you know, disappeared. And this is kind of a retelling of that. It is, there is a romance. Um, I wouldn't say this book is a romance book, but I would still call, like, I would still categorize it as a historical romance. Um even though it isn't necessarily a, it isn't necessarily a historical romance. Uh, da, da. And then <clears throat> the next book I have is Douglas, Lord of Heartache by Grace Burroughs. And now Grace Burroughs writes She's written dozens and dozens and dozens of historical romances, and I have read my fair share of them. 
Um, all of I've read all of the Wyndham books, um, the Daughters and the Sons and the Duke and his Duchess, all of the novellas and whatever that go with those. Um, and then I read Douglas first though. It was a free book probably 10, 15 years ago. Um, I, my mom downloaded on a Kindle and I read it and I loved it. And this is about a woman whose name is Gwen, um, who has a bastard daughter and the man who comes into their lives to, he kind of comes into their lives by accident um, and then falls in love with Gwen and with her daughter and kind of goes from there. These are connected to the Wyndham books because um, the father of Gwen's daughter is in fact was one of the Wyndham children, Victor. Um, this book happens prior to the events of the heir. Um, and we do get to see some of the characters in this book. And I do, I, and I do like, I do like this book. I don't remember a whole lot about it. I haven't read it. I mean, I haven't read it in years, I think. Um, but it is a good book. Like, it, I mean, it's not even just a good book. It's a pretty, it's a pretty great book. Um, <clears throat> uh, and yeah, I just, I really liked it. I really felt Great Grace Burroughs is a very like her writing style is so it reminds me of like the Bronte sisters and of like Jane Austen a little bit. It's very old old English kind of feeling, I guess you could say. Um but anyway, the next two books are kind of cheats and they're both by Susan Elizabeth Phillips. And they kind of take place, um, they were modern for their times. I think both of these books were written in, like, the late 80s, early 90s. And the first, <coughs> is Fancy Pants. And these are both books in the Winnet, Texas series um and the first book let me just see yeah um uh th this book is says it comes first in the series but it was published second but one book was published in 1987 and the other book was published in 1989 um uh, and fancy pants is about um a british socialite um, named Francesca and, um, a, like, very famous golf star named, um, Dallas Bodine or Dally. And, um, the beginning of this story takes place, kind of, we get to see Francesca's mom first and then Francesca and her early life um and straight up like again like through so this book happened the majority of it in like the 70s and 80s and I, I it was again it was a modern book for its time but I guess that's considered historical now which is why it's like <clears throat> a cheat but I did enjoy this book a lot um I really, like, Francesca's character is so unique. And that is one thing I love about Susan Elizabeth Phillips is her characters are so not your usual, they're not your usual stereotypes and her books don't follow the usual beat. Like, the conflicts aren't your typical run-of-the-mill um conflicts that you you see with a lot of historical romances or romances in general I mean this was technically a contemporary book for its time um and then the next one is Glitter Baby and I consider this one a true um a true historical because this is about Fleur 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 yes Fleur um what is her last name Savage Savagar. Fleur Savagar. And Fleur 
is not the main character in her own book because the first third of this book to first half is actually about Fleur's mother who and it's very steeped in Gilded Age because Fleur's father is like a I would put probably in the same boots as um let me look of Errol Flynn and I actually think that maybe that was her father I don't remember for sure it's been a long time since I have read this book again um but anyway so this is about this is kind of like a generational book because again it has her mother and her mother longs to be loved and so she falls in love with this famous actor who's a little older and he's kind of washed up and this other man falls in love with her and it's kind of like a battle of the wills between the three of them she ends up pregnant and Alexi who was in love with her kind of forces her to marry him and so then they have this daughter Fleur um who isn't really you know Alexi's daughter and it kind of goes from there as um Fleur's mother makes her into this model who uh, I guess is compared to like Twiggy. I think she's very much, you know, um, in the book described as not being like other women, but very striking, very strong features. She's very tall and athletic <coughs> and very, very famous. Like it becomes very famous very quickly, like blows up overnight until she is she's cast in a film and um she's only like 17 years old and something happens and so she runs away and we have the story progress from there but this movie like I really liked how it kind of began in like the dying light of the Gilded Age and all of the things you know, I mean and like it's it was a very interesting look into what happens to actors of, that aren't popular anymore I just I kind of enjoyed that um and then the next one is the McKinnon's Bride by Tanya Ann Crosby and this is also a book that I have read a couple of times I've reread it several times I read it for the first time, I don't know, years and years and years ago. Uh, I think as like a physical book and then I got the ebook and I have read it numerous times. Um, and this is about Paige who is a daughter of a man who has kidnapped the son of a Scottish Laird, I believe. I believe he's a Laird. Um, yeah, his name is Ian McKinnon. Um... And so when he comes to collect his son, he also kidnaps the daughter of this enemy man and kind of starts to realize things aren't exactly what they, they, they have seemed. Um, and I, I just, I loved it. This is a very sweet story. Paige is very, um, I don't know, she's very innocent feeling. But it was just a good story. And I love me a good Scottish Highlander romance. <laughs> so I had to throw one in there. And the last book on this list is A Countess Below Stairs by Eva Ibbotson. And I love this book. I The amount of love I have for this book knows no bounds. I have reread this. I have the physical a copy of this book um and you know books I have I, I have one bookshelf if I have a physical copy of a book it's because I absolutely fucking love it this book is about the most gentlest of souls and her name is Anna and Anna is the daughter of um distant Russian royalty this happens kind of in the aftermath of the first world war 
Um, and her mother and her and her brother and some other refugees from Russia have come to live in England. And she ends up working as a maid um, for a man named, what is he? Um, Rupert, who is an earl. And no one really knows that Anna is a, a countess. So, she, you know, she, by European standards, she far outranks quite a lot of people. And Rupert is engaged to an heiress named Muriel. Um, and this is just kind of like, the, this story is more than just a story. Um, there is so much that goes on to it that it talks of like the times, you know, Rupert was never meant to be the Earl. His brother was and his brother died in the war. Um, Rupert met Muriel. She was a nurse and he was um, injured in the war. Um, you know, there, there are just so many layers to this. And Anna is the sweetest, most loving, kind, gentle, spirited creature you will ever meet. She always wanted to be a ballerina. She dances. She dances beautifully. <clears throat> um, she is eager to please. She is just so sweet and romantic hearted. And again, this is, I mean, I never watched it, but I would compare this to the things I have heard about Downton Abbey because it happens kind of at the same, in the same time frame. You know, they're right after World War Um one leading into the Roaring Twenties and all that that entails. Um, but yeah, I just, I love this book. Uh, I hope that there's a book on here maybe you haven't heard of before that you're interested in picking up. I would love to hear some of your his modern historical romance recommendations. If you have any books that aren't from your typical Victorian Edwardian eras, I would love to hear them. I love historical books that aren't set <clears throat> um, in typical times, you know, so like mid, you know, mid 20th century, early 20th century, earlier than that, you know, like 15, 1600s. Um, but yeah, I hope, again, you enjoyed your time here and I will see you in the next video. Bye.